So it was probably a level that they felt. They just didn't really care that much about, but they did feel it and they were aware that it was there. Early on, when the behaviorism movement first started, there was this sort of belief that unless there's a change of behavior, we can't say that learning has occurred. That we can only say learning has occurred through an observable change in behavior. That was sort of like one of the tenets of early behaviorism. But through some careful experimentation, uh, developed a concept called behaviorally silent learning. And the way they discovered this was actually really sort of eloquent, like very simple study that was able to determine this. So what they did was, um, we've talked a lot about like conditioning, right? Like you put one signal before another and based on the prediction, like that's how dogs learn, right? Like you want me to say duck before I swing the broom towards your head, right? So what they did was they took some rats. A lot of the early experiments on negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement were all done with rats. Um, and what they did was they first exposed them, they put them in a little box where there was a buzzer and a light. And with nothing really going on, they put them in that box and they just turned on the light and then right afterwards turned on the buzzer. Turned on the light, turned on the buzzer with like a two minute pause in between. So light, buzzer, two minute pause. Light, buzzer, two minute pause. And they did this a ton. Now, neither the light nor the buzzer meant anything to the rats. So like, they didn't, the rats didn't do anything, but they were just in this chamber and the light turned on and then the buzzer turned on. So no change of behavior, of course. But separately, they put them in a different chamber and paired the buzzer to an electrical shock. Buzzer, shock, buzzer, shock, buzzer, shock. Now, the, the light buzzer pairing happened first then the buzzer shock pairing. Now separately to all of this, they put these rats in a chamber where there was a lever they could press for food. So they press the lever and food comes out into a little thing, a little tray. And they kind of clocked like the average rate of lever pressing for food, right? So once the rats figure out that this gets food, maybe they press it, let's just say for simplicity, um, 60 times a minute, which means one time per second on average. So we've got in this little chamber, yay, I'm pressing this lever. Now the rats have learned that a buzzer predicts a shock so predictably, if they were pressing the lever and then they sounded the buzzer, you would expect the rats to maybe stop pressing the lever. The rats didn't learn anything about the light predicting a shock at all. So what they did was they had them in this chamber, the rats are pressing the lever, and they turn the light on. And guess what? The rats stopped pressing the lever. So the rats learned an association between the light and the buzzer, even though there was no actual change in behavior. It was the a bright enough light and a loud enough buzzer that it was in their awareness. They were attentive of it. They just had no reason to care until the buzzer was further paired with the shock. So buzzer predicts shock, but light predicts buzzer. And because of classical conditioning, light predicts shock. What was really important was the order that they made that happen. It wouldn't have shown the same clarity of the concept if they had done the buzzer shock pairing before the light buzzer pairing. So it was really important that they paired the light and the buzzer. That was the first thing they did before the buzzer had any value at all. And only later on paired the buzzer with the shock. Really simple, really simple experiment, but they were able to, to prove that learning to, can take place even if there's no observable change in behavior. Very fascinating. So if we, if we are relatively confident that the dog is at least feeling the level that we're on, just because you're not seeing the behavior change doesn't mean the dog isn't learning. And if you're concerned about a dog who maybe, um, like, uh, your one, yeah, Kenzie, where like, we just want to be careful about being too strong. We're like, I'm pretty, pretty certain she's feeling a two, even though it's not like the recall is not getting better. Like just get reps in on that level because you'll gain fluency. And then later on, you can bump it up to a motivational level. And that's basically when I said that Bart Bellin will often start puppies on e-collars, that's kind of what he's doing. He's using a level that they're aware of, but isn't really that big of a motivator. And he's just teaching them the relationship between the stimulation and other behaviors and other forms of input and getting them a lot of exposure to those relationships before he ever uses the collar in a motivational way. And that prepares the dog so that when it is motivational, they're super clear-headed about it. They know exactly what to do when they feel it. So just bear that in mind. 
we tend to kind of, again, we want to push dogs through because in boarding trains and such, like if you've got two weeks, for instance, like you don't want to monkey around with behaviorally silent learning for too long. Like you want to make sure that you're seeing the observable changes in your behavior because you only got two weeks. You got to make sure the dog's clean before they go home. But again, if it's like your personal dog and you don't mind taking some time, if you're, if you're certain the dog is aware of the feeling, it's okay if it's not actually changing their behavior, they may still be learning about the relationships between the behavior and the stim. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's a lot of what happened like in the first few reps of that session. By the, by the time we started rolling the dial, she knew what to do. Yeah, nice. Things are starting to click. Nice. Good job. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah.